just beautiful, isn't it? It's, it's, just, it's, it's mesmerizing. It's, it's double helix sighting. You really can tell just by looking at it how sort of important and amazing it is. It's pretty much the most complicated molecule that exists and potentially the most important one. It's so complex that we didn't even know for sure what it looked like until about 60 years ago. It's so multifariously awesome that if you took all of it from just one of our cells and untangled it, it would be taller than me. Now consider that there are probably 50 trillion cells in my body right now. Laid end to end, the DNA in those cells would stretch to the sun not once, but 600 times. Mind blown yet? Hey, you want to make one? Of course, you know, I'm talking about deoxyribonucleic acid, known to its friends as DNA. DNA is what stores our genetic instructions, the information that programs all of our cells' activities. It's a six billion letter code that provides the assembly instructions for everything that you are. And it does the same thing for pretty much every other living thing. I'm going to go out on a limb here and assume that you are a human, in which case every body cell that you have, or somatic cell, in you has 46 chromosomes, each containing one big DNA molecule. These chromosomes are packed together tightly with proteins in the nucleus of the cell. DNA is nucleic acid, and so is its cousin, which we'll also be talking about, ribonucleic acid, or RNA. Now, if you can uh, make your mind do this, remember all the way back to episode three, where we talked about all the important biological molecules, carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. That ring a bell? Well, nucleic acids are the fourth major group of biological molecules, and for my money, they have the most complicated job of all. Structurally, they're polymers, which means that each one is made up of many small repeating molecular units. In DNA, these small units are called nucleotides. Link them together and you have yourself a polynucleotide. Now, before we actually put these tiny parts together to build a DNA molecule, like some microscopic piece of IKEA furniture, let's first take a look at what makes up each nucleotide. We're gonna need three things. One, a five carbon sugar molecule, two, a phosphate group, and three, one of four nitrogen bases. DNA gets the first part of its name from our our first ingredient, the sugar molecule, which is called deoxyribose. But all the really significant stuff, the genetic coding that makes you you, is found among the four nitrogenous bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. It's important to note that in living organisms, DNA doesn't exist as a single polynucleotide molecule, but rather a pair of molecules that are held tightly together. They're like an intertwined microscopic double spiral staircase, basically just a ladder, but twisted, the famous double helix. And like any good structure, we have to have have a main support. In DNA, the sugars and phosphates bond together to form twin backbones. These sugar phosphate bonds run down each side of the helix, but chemically in opposite directions. In other words, if you look at each of the sugar phosphate backbones, you'll see that one appears to be upside down in relation to the other. One strand begins at the top of the first phosphate connected to the sugar molecule's fifth carbon, and then ending where the next phosphate would go with a free end at the sugar's third carbon. This creates a pattern called five prime and three prime. I've always thought that the deoxyribose with an arrow with the oxygen as a point. It always points from three prime to five prime. Now on the other strand, it's exactly the opposite. It begins up top with a free end at the sugar's third carbon, and then the phosphates connect to the sugar's fifth carbons all the way down. And it ends at the bottom with the phosphate, and you've probably figured this out already, but this is called the three prime to five prime direction. Now it is time to make ourselves one of these famous double helices. These two long chains are linked together by the nitrogenous bases via relatively weak hydrogen bonds. But they can't be just any pair of nitrogenous bases. Thankfully, when it comes to figuring out what part goes where, all you have to do is remember that if one nucleotide has an adenine base, only thymine can be its counterpart. Likewise, guanine can only bond with cytosine. These bonded nitrogenous bases are called base pairs. The GC pairing has three hydrogen bonds, making it slightly stronger than the AT base pair, which only has two. It's the order of these four nucleobases, or the base sequence, that allows your DNA to create you. So AGGT CCATG means something completely different as a base sequence than, say, TTCAGTCG. Human chromosome 1, the largest of all of our chromosomes, contains a single molecule of DNA with 247 million base pairs. If you printed all of the letters of chromosome 1 into a book, it would be about 200,000 pages long. And each of your somatic cells has 46 DNA molecules tightly packed into its nucleus. That's one for each of your chromosomes. Put all 46 molecules together and we're talking about roughly 6 billion base pairs in every cell. This 
is the longest book that I've ever read. It's about a thousand pages long. If we were to fill it with our DNA sequence, we'd need about 10,000 of them to fit our entire genome. RNA is certainly similar to its cousin DNA. It has a sugar phosphate backbone with nucleotide bases attached to it, but there are three major differences. One, RNA is a single-stranded molecule, no double helix here. Two, the sugar in RNA is ribose, which has one more oxygen atom than deoxyribose, hence the whole starting with an R instead of a D thing. And finally, RNA does not contain thymine. Its fourth nucleotide is the base uracil, so it bonds with adenine instead. RNA is super important to the production of our proteins, and you'll see later that it has a crucial role in the replication of DNA.